Well, my name is Thomas Workman. I'm an adjunct professor at, at UMass Dartmouth Law School. I teach scientific evidence there, which includes drug analysis. Um, I'm also an, a, a criminal defense attorney, and I do expert witness work around the country on crime labs and on uh, analysis of, of drugs, and, and alcohol in particular. And I, uh, as part of my work, I obtained a copy of the state police database of the Annie Dukan um, cases. And some of the things that you found are very interesting. It looks like as if there are it looks as if there are patterns from your data analysis, um, namely uh, which uh, which cases. I think, to me anyway, that what's interesting is cases that were expedited and the number of expedited cases per county. Can you explain that? Sure. Uh, at some point in the the crime lab there was a procedure implemented to allow the various counties to expedite samples, that is to get them done out of turn and get them done faster. What I found interesting was that the the percentage of cases that were expedited was not consistent from county to county. It varied tremendously from county to county. And the counties that had the highest number of expedites <coughs> were Norfolk and Suffolk, which are the counties where the crime lab resides. So it would appear that there's a correlation between personal contact with people and the number of expedites. And that should not be. Expedites ought to be done for reasons of the, of the court's business, not because of personal relationships. And I would think that's probably the most likely explanation for why the expedites were so, so different. For example, in Bristol County, where I live, the number of expedites was less than 4 or 5%. And in Suffolk County, it was six to seven times that quantity of expedites. And you would not expect to see that unless there's an explanation for why um, those expedites are being done. Mm -hmm. And they're not being done for business. They're being done for other purposes. You think so? I think so because, w you know, we have drug problems in Bristol County, and we have a very aggressive prosecutor in Sam Sutter, and he would not be allowing cases to not proceed. If the expediters need to be done, he would be expediting the cases. Um, and that's not the case. I also uh, noticed that there was an analysis of some of the types of drugs uh, that <coughs> were found. Based on the database from the state, there was an analysis of the types of drugs and, some of, and, and the charges based on the drugs that were tested. What stands out in your mind from that? Well, there were, I guess, a couple things that stood out. One was I I found some drugs that were listed as illegal substances, which, um, which I know from my very basic chemistry are not illegal substances. For example, I found a drug cert signed off by Annie Dukin that listed the illegal drug as being sodium chloride. Well, sodium chloride is table salt. So why would we be prosecuting someone for possessing table salt? And it. Uh, it turned out to be a saline solution, the type of solution you'd put in your eye, and it was, it was sterile, so it, it came by way of a prescription from a pharmacy. But I don't think our legislature intends that we be prosecuting people for possessing table salt. And I think your, your station found a number of cases in the, in the data which you independently obtained um, that had ibuprofen listed as the illegal drug. And ibuprofen is a commonly taken um, pain killer, an analgesic. So, I, you know, how could, how can we as a state be prosecuting people? Uh, and I believe there were over a hundred of the ibuprofen cases in the database. So we have a hundred people who, over the past few years, just Annie Dukin, have been prosecuted for ibuprofen. I, I, what surprised me was I can understand sodium chloride. Maybe a police officer doesn't know what that is. But Annie Dukin knows what sodium chloride is. She's a chemist. She's a you know she's a a chemist working for the Commonwealth as a you know hired as a chemist, and she knows what sodium chloride is. And yet she signed a drug cert under the pains and penalties of perjury that said that this individual person possessed an illegal substance, to wit, sodium chloride. And we should say, we think that that sodium chloride was saline solution, prescription saline solution, and there could have been, you know, there could have been some sort of a mix-up as to who the prescription was for. Sure. 
but again, I, I think a chemist needs to have the common sense to know that sodium chloride is table salt and that it's inappropriate to fill out a drug cert and say someone possesses an illegal drug, that drug being salt. There is, uh, there's also uh, data suggesting that the time it took Annie Dukan to conduct her tests um, was uh, much faster than the other chemists at the lab, and um, she was incredibly productive um, compared to her colleagues. Your analysis shows what regarding that? Well, one of the things that, that was said in the press initially was poor Annie Dukan, she had to do uh, had to do this because of the pressures that were exerted from the Melendez Diaz court case. And we should say that that's the case that requires chemists to appear in court and sure. testify when they test the drugs. That case basically said that the Commonwealth would be required to produce a live witness in order to testify in court about the drug analysis that was done. And so you would you might expect that that would place a much larger workload on the chemists and that would cause the amount of time that it takes to process the samples to grow and become longer. But in fact with Annie that is not what happened. She began to process her cases more quickly months before Melendez Diaz and after Melendez Diaz she continued to turn around her samples increasingly faster as time progressed. So what that means is that she was getting better and better at, at doing these analyses faster and faster as time progressed. Melendez Diaz did not slow her down. She continued to, to um, decrease the amount of time, tur the turnaround time, and it went from something like 10 months to something like two months in a period of about 18 months. And um, you know, you, you scratch your head and say, how could someone do that? Um, and the obvious answer that comes to mind is they weren't doing the work. They were dry labbing. They were simply filling out the paperwork and not doing the work. Um, I can't say that all of those were dry labbing, but I can say that Annie Dukin admitted that she was dry labbing, and I can say that the workload that she was handling was so out of, uh, uh, out of character from the rest of the chemists there that if it wasn't dry labbing, I'd love to hear the explanation. Um, we should say that uh, we're talking about a database um, that was released to defense attorneys that we obtained, not through you, uh, that listed thousands and thousands of cases um, that were potentially linked to uh, Annie Dukan. Uh, the cases were very difficult to track. The data is difficult to track. There are no docket numbers on this data. Uh, there are no names, so uh, you know we're looking at basic sample listings, types of drugs, which counties they came from, the time it took to test, and all of those mm -hmm. kinds of things, and we're trying to, to see what we can ascertain from there. Separately, there is a database from the judiciary listing uh, the cases that have appeared in Superior Court, the number of appearances in court, and what's happened with those. Those do have the docket numbers. We don't have a sample number like the first database. Correct. This is, this is the judiciary's listing of the Annie Dukan cases to date. There are between seven and 800 <coughs> of those cases, I believe, so far. And we've also looked at what trend we might be able to see from the judiciary database. And thus far from that database, what do you see? Well, the, I guess the first thing that I saw, I, I plotted all of the dates and all of the cases on a, a large piece of paper to look to see if there were any trends in the information. And were things being done in a consistent manner from county to county? And they're not. Um, some counties started significantly before others. Some counties started much later than other counties. Essex County, for example, did not start their hearings until several weeks after the rest of the Commonwealth had already begun processing these cases. Um, Bristol County has at most two court appearances for any cases that have been handled in Bristol County. Uh, my county is unique in that aspect in that most other counties have multiple appearances, as many as nine in Essex County. There's one case with nine, case, nine appearances, which is the case that Matthew Siegel with the ACLU is representing, because I know that case. Um, and I don't know whether that's good or bad. It could be that Bristol County is allowing whatever the attorneys are asking for, but that's not what I'm hearing from my colleagues. I'm hearing from my colleagues that it's very difficult to get relief in, in Bristol County. Um, so it makes a difference what county you live in as to what relief you can get through the um, 
through these drug courts that have been set up. The Commonwealth has set up special courts to, to handle these, and uh, it's not being processed the same way from county to county. In some counties, there's an initial court appearance, and there's 30 or 40 cases that are all heard in one week, and then nothing happens for six to eight weeks. The, they're, they're all continued for eight weeks. In other counties, it may be that people come back in two weeks to have the second hearing. Um, I, I have to believe that the similar work is being done in all the counties, but yet the way the courts are processing the cases are very different from county to county, and that shouldn't be. There ought to be, uh, you ought to get the same justice whether you're living in Suffolk County or Norfolk County or Bristol County or whatever county you're living in. Overall, if there's a message that you think you get from your analysis of the data, uh, what is it? The data is a mess. The data is a real mess. We can't figure out how to link. Um, in my own practice, I cannot figure out how to, to, to find whether my clients were processed, had their samples processed by Annie Dukin. And I have the database, and I have a database that I've maintained myself of all of my clients. So my first thought was, well, I'll just match these up, and I should be able to find my clients. Well, I can't. Uh, the names are not entered accurately. Some of the names say things like CI, which is for, stands for confidential informant. There are other cases that say fat man. Well, maybe the defendant was a fat man, but I can't match that up in my database to one of my clients. Um, there is no way to link a court docket number to a sample number. And what I find a bit ironic is when the judiciary finally created their document, they did not put the sample number into their data into their table so that we could look at what that sample information is in the in the database and even see whether that case is in the database or not i don't know that all of the all of annie ducan's samples are in the database that the state police have provided the judiciary could do us a service and put that sample number in certainly they've checked it they're not going to process a case that annie did not do and they ought to be saying, what was the sample number for the case that we're doing here? And that could go right into that spreadsheet so that we could link from the judiciary document to the state police document. But we don't have that link. As a taxpayer, I get angry when I see that there's no way to link a court case with the drug lab. And my estimation is that perhaps half of the capacity in the drug labs is being wasted. It's being spent on cases that have already been resolved. A defendant has already pled guilty, and yet we're still going to do the, the drug sample analysis. The sodium chloride case that I talked with you about, that case had already been dismissed in the court, and then Annie Dukin did her analysis months later. Now, you know, you can complain about what the substance was, but there's a generic problem there, and that is that if, if a defendant goes into court, pleads guilty, uh, goes off to jail, Eight months later, the crime lab will get that sample and spend the time and money to analyze it, which is a total waste of the Commonwealth's money. We could probably do our work for half of what we spend on the drug labs, and all we'd have to do is create a link, a data link, between the docket number in the courts and a docket number in the samples that are given to the crime lab. That is so trivial to, to do, but we're not doing it. If I could just add, in Texas, they recently had a, a drug uh, chemist who, who strayed. And within 24 hours, the state of Texas was able to identify every single case that that chemist had touched um, with specificity. We are still struggling. Attorney Meyer is still struggling to try to get a list of the, the cases that, um, that Annie Ducan processed. And to my knowledge, he still has not published that list. And I think it's because the data is that is that messy. It's just not not what we would expect. So then how do we know that these <coughs> conclusions we're drawing from it are correct? Well, we have to make some assumptions. We have to assume that the data that we have is representative of Annie's work. It may not be complete, but if it's a representative sample of her work, let's say it's only 90 percent of what she's done, we have to assume that the other 10 percent has the same general characteristics as what we see. Um, and I think that's a fairly that's, that's a fair assumption to make. Um, and then we have to assume that the data that's been entered is, is accurate or that it's uh, correct. Um, in my analysis of the data, one thing that you look for is whether the 
the analysis date is before the date that the drug came into the lab. That's impossible. But if the data is really messed up, you'll see that kind of an error in the, the drug um, data. I don't see that kind of a problem. What I see is a problem in identifying the person who's associated with the sample. Um, it's really not appropriate to put names into those samples. The, the chemist doing the work should not know who the, the defendant is. They have no reason to know that in doing their work uh, because that introduces bias. It, it is not fair to the crime lab chemist to uh, tell them this is, a, um, this is Whitey Bulger's sample because a person doing the, the chemical work will be biased to find a positive result when maybe the results are not positive. And that bias is, is just human nature. It's not anything that they do that's wrong. It's just that we need to let the chemist analyze the drug and tell us what it is, not introduce other factors into the analysis. What about um, broader, uh, broader terms? Uh, from this. I mean, it, we may know that the data is a mess, but what about the way uh, that we define a chemist and a chemist's role in, in drug cases? I mean, do, should we take a message or can we? Or was this a rogue chemist uh, that sort of made a mess of our criminal justice system? Or do you think it's, it's something bigger and there's a bigger message there about um, the way drug cases are handled in Massachusetts? Well, the National Academy of Sciences recently published a report to the U.S. Congress, and in it they talked about how to fix the problems that we have in our forensic science labs across the country. And one of the top things that they pointed out was the management needs to be independent from law enforcement. If you have the management structure of the lab report through law enforcement, you will begin to see people um, working to achieve what law enforcement wants to see happen. And law enforcement wants convictions. Um, I recently saw data in Florida where there's actually a report card for the chemist. So when the chemist goes to testify in court, they get a report card from the prosecutor. The prosecutor fills out this report card, sends it into the crime lab, and when you get a performance review in the crime lab, here is stapled to your review are these report cards. So if you, if you know that your pay is going to depend upon how well you please the prosecutor, what are you going to say when you go to court to testify for the prosecutor? Are you going to go there to testify as to the truth, or are you going to go to support the prosecutor's goal of the conviction? And I think if we expect people to go and tell the truth, we can't have report cards. We can't have the, the tight linkage between the chemists and law enforcement, or we're going to get exactly what we deserve, and that is a, a very biased system.